So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on breast cancer prevention and screening, um, which we've put together to mark Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Ginevra. I am the communications officer at ECL, the European Association of Cancer Leagues, and um, I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Um, this webinar is uh, part of a series uh, focusing and zooming in on different messages of the European Code Against Cancer. And today's webinar in particular is co-hosted with the Institute of Oncology Ljubljana and the My Personal, Personal Breast Cancer Screening Project. And I am utterly delighted uh, to be having with he here with me this afternoon uh, Madina Bagonusova uh, from our youth group, uh, Dr. Katia Yarm, uh, epidemiologist at the Institute of Oncology Ljubljana, and Dr. Suzette La Loge, uh, who this after afternoon will be wearing her hat as the coordinating investigator of the MyPEBS mm -hmm. uh, project. Uh, in the background, I also have my colleagues, uh, David Ricci, the Cancer Prevention Manager at ECL, and uh, my colleague, Adele Barlassina, who is managing the youth group. Uh, in terms of the agenda, um, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping items in a minute. Uh, then Madina will give you a brief overview of the European Code Against Cancer and our Youth Ambassadors program. Uh, then Dr. Yarm will present for about 20 minutes uh, before taking some questions. Um, Dr. De La Loge will also present for about 20 minutes and she will take uh, another round of questions. Um, and then uh, we'll have a short interactive poll at the end to kind of test your knowledge. And if the time allows, uh, we will also take another round of final questions uh, before some concluding remarks by my colleague, David. Um, in terms of housekeeping, um, if your connection is poor, uh, there's an option you can switch your, between your phone and audio connection. Um, as I mentioned, you'll be able to answer questions after each of the keynote presentations, um, presentations and you can do that by typing uh, your questions and comments into the chat box. Just please ensure to address those questions to all panelists and attendees. Um, the chat will be monitored by my colleague David and he will be the one um, picking the questions and posing them to the speakers. Um, once the webinar is over, uh, you will be redirected to a very short uh, questionnaire. Uh, we do really value your feedback, so please uh, try and make the time to answer five uh, quick questions. And uh, just to flag, uh, this webinar is recorded, uh, will be uploaded to YouTube, um, where you can also find all the other webinars part of this series. Uh, you can see on the slides at the bottom. And um, you will also receive a, a thank you email um, with a link to the recording, as well as the presentation slides uh, early next week. Um, great, so I hope you are all well prepared and excited to learn more about breast cancer, the European Code Against Cancer, and the MyPreds project uh, as much as I am. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'll just hand over to Madina. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Madina. I'm a youth ambassador of, uh, for European Code Against Cancer for Kazakhstan and medical student. Uh, I'm very excited about this webinar and appreciate this opportunity. So I will proceed with brief information uh, about European Code Against Cancer and Youth Ambassador Program. So European Code Against Cancer is an initiative of European Commission, uh, which was developed by World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer. IARC and leading scientists from across Europe uh, compiled uh, the ECAC based on the latest scientific evidence for the first time in 1987. The latest fourth edition was published in 2014. The ECAC aims to inform people about actions that they can take themselves and their families to reduce risk of developing cancer and is made up, uh, made up of 12 messages recommending lifestyle modifications uh, that anybody can easily follow without any special skill or advice. Uh, the, in short, the code is a preventive tool aimed to reduce the cancer burden by informing people how to avoid or reduce uh, cancerogenic exposures, adopt behaviors to reduce the cancer risk, uh, or participate in organized intervention program. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, it is estimated that cancer burden could be reduced by up to 50% if the available scientific knowledge about the cause of cancer could be effectively 
translated into successful prevention. The code, in fact, is also meant to form the base uh, to guide national health policies in cancer prevention. As highlighted in this uh, footnote of the ECAC reported in the slide, successful pre cancer prevention requires a combination of individual preventive and group governmental action. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to focus and delve into messages 10 and 12 of the ECAC. For women, breastfeeding reduces mother's risk uh, if you can uh, mother's cancer risk if you can breastfeed your baby hormone replacement therapy increases the risk of certain cancers limit the use of hrt okay? take part in organized cancer screening program programs for breast cancer okay uh, the messages of the code are highly promoted by cl youth ambassadors of which i'm a part uh, the Youth Ambassadors program is an initiative of ECL, which was started in 2015 uh, to bring together motivated students and young professionals from different countries, background, to share ideas, get trained, and create actions and campaigns aimed to disseminating and promoting the ECAC at national, regional, and local level in their countries of residence. Mm -hmm. Um, the network is very diverse in terms of countries, ages, and backgrounds. Currently, there are um, 67 youth ambassadors across 38 countries in the European, uh, in the WHO European region. Among us, there are medical doctors, public health specialists, lawyers, psychologists, nutritionists, political scientists. We learn a lot from each other and meet uh, every year on the occasion of summer school. Mm -hmm. Uh, to disseminate and promote the European Code Against Cancer among young people uh, and general public who take part in joint and individual actions. Some examples are highlighted on this slide. In 2019, uh, we carried out 205 different actions. Mm -hmm. uh, on a more personal note, I became youth ambassador um, for my country last year. In my role as youth ambassador for Kazakhstan, I have translated ICAC in Kazakh language, started national Facebook and Instagram pages about uh, the ICAC, and organized an event to mark World Breastfeeding Week in support, uh, with support from ECL and my university in one of the big malls uh, in Astana, where I distributed uh, the leaflets with high yield information about the benefits of breastfeeding, emphasizing on cancer risk reduction, as well as back promotion. Uh, thank you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Medina, uh, to give a brief overview of the ECAC and uh, also for your uh, for describing your personal experience as a youth ambassadors. Uh, you've done a lot in this past year, and it was great to to have you on board. Um, so, um, whilst uh, Dr. Yarm uh, is sharing her screen, I'll just uh, take a minute to introduce her. Um, Katia Yarm is um, graduated in medicine from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, and afterwards specialized in public health uh, in 2012. Uh, she currently works at the Institute of Oncology Ljubljana as a, an epidemiologist um, in the Slovenian Breast Cancer Program, uh, DORA. Um, she's responsible for the unit uh, managing the screening registry and the screening programs uh, called Santa, which actively invites women in the target population uh, for mammography screening in 21 locations across Slovenia, uh, and also is in charge of delivering negative screening results and communicating with the women in a timely manner. Um, her unit uh, also prepares screening reports and evaluates the efficiency of the program uh, through performance indicators. So without further ado, I'll just let the floor to uh, Dr. Yarm. Uh, if you could just switch display settings to full version. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello. I will start uh, shortly with uh, breast anatomy. Uh, so you can follow um, the uh, further slides better. Uh, each breast, breast contains 15 to 20 lobes of glandular tissue, uh, arranged like a flower um, uh, around the, uh, the nipple. The lobes are further then divided into smaller lobules that produce milk for breastfeeding. Uh, small tubes or ducts conduct the milk to a reservoir that lies just beneath the nipple. Uh, breast cancer uh, 
is cancer that forms in the cells of the breast. And cancer is caused by DNA changes or mutations, which cause normal breast cells to become cancer cells. Some DNA mutations are inherited or passed to you from your parents. This means the mutations are in all your cells when you are born. And some types of mutations can greatly increase uh, the risk of breast cancers. Uh, only around 5% of breast cancer is uh, inherited breast cancer. Most DNA mutations linked to breast cancer are acquired. This means the mutations arise in breast cells during a person's life and are only present in the breast cancer cells. Lifestyle and hormones play a role in many cases of breast cancer, but it's not still fully understood how different events can lead to mutations. We name uh, cancer types according to the part of the breast where a cancer occurs. Invasive cancer means the cancer cells have broken out of the lobal where they began and have the potential to spread to the lymph nodes and other sites of the body. Invasive breast cancer can begin in the breast ducts. It's called invasive ductal carcinoma or in the lobules. Uh, this is called invasive lobular car carcinoma. The most common type of breast cancer is invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, in case of non-invasive cancer, the cancer cells have not broken out of the lobules uh, or ducts. Uh, it can be either, again, ductal or lobular uh, carcinoma in situ. Inflammatory breast cancer is a rare type of breast cancer uh, that develops rapidly. Uh, making the affected breast red, uh, tender, and swollen. Uh, the reason for this is that cancer cells block the lymphatic vessels in skin covering the breast. Another rare uh, form of breast cancer is Paget disease. Paget's disease of the breast starts uh, on the nipple and extends to the areola around the nipple. Disease occurs most often in women older than 50. Uh, and most women with Paget have underlying ductal breast cancer, either in situ or less commonly invasive breast cancer. Um, now something about breast cancer symptoms. Uh, one of the breast cancer symptoms is a breast lump or thickening that feels different from the surrounding tissue. A typical cancer um, is firm, has irregular borders and is attached to the skin or deep fascia uh, with dimpling or nipple retraction. Uh, benign tumors typical are mobile and uh, have uh, well-defined margins and a soft or rubbery texture. Uh, then another breast symptom is change in the size, shape or color of a breast. Another one changes to the skin uh, of the breast such as dimpling. A nipple can be newly inverted. Areola of breast skin uh, uh, can be peeling, scaling, or crusting. Um, redness or pitting of the skin over, over, of, uh, over the breast, like the skin of an orange. And also any unusual liquid from either nipple can be a breast cancer symptom. Uh, pain. Uh, in the breast is not usually a sign of a breast cancer, but uh, we should be careful if pain is there all the time or most of the time. And any unusual change listed here doesn't necessarily mean that we have breast cancer uh, and most breast cancer changes are not because of cancer, but it's important to get checked by GP. Uh, short about breast cancer epidemiology, uh, breast cancer burden, uh, meaning incidence, is higher 
in well-developed countries uh, like uh, Northern America, Europe or Australia. And on the contrary, uh, uh, breast cancer mortality, mortality is higher in less developed countries like uh, African, Africa. In the Europe, uh, breast cancer uh, represents one, one fourth of new of new cancer cases among European females and breast cancer death, breast represents around 16% of cancer deaths in European females. Uh, if we compare uh, breast cancer burden among European countries, we see that it is the highest in uh, countries like Belgium, Cyprus, Netherlands, Luxembourg, and uh, it is low in countries like Estonia, Latvia, Slovakia, Lithuania, Bulgaria. In Slovenia, where I come from, uh, the cancer burden is below the European average. A five-year relative survival is about is above 80% in majority of European countries uh, here colored in blue. Um, and those results are from a very big survival research called Concord 3. And now about risk factors. For breast cancer, a risk factor is anything that increases our chances of getting a disease. Uh, breast cancer, uh, like other cancers, is a multifactorial disease. Its risk factors strongly reflect hormonal, uh, hormonal etiology. Uh, relevant biological exposures are levels of estrogens, androgens, prolactin and growth factors and uh, reproductive and lifestyle factors and anthropometric factors are the most common. We list risk factors in two groups, non-modifiable and modifiable. Non-modifiable factors are those we cannot change. Uh, the first one is of course being born female. Uh, another one is getting older because most of cancers uh, occur, occur in women that are older than 50. Uh, there are also some inherited genes. Uh, some of them we know very well, like BRCA genes, ATM, TP53, cheek genes, uh, meaning that a carrier of uh, one of the, the, this uh, mutation, like BRCA, uh, has uh, around 80% uh, risk that he, he will be she will be diagnosed with uh, breast cancer till uh, the age of 85. Uh, uh, also, family history is uh, important uh, because having a first degree relative, this is mother, sister or daughter uh, with breast cancer, uh, doubles a woman's risk for um, getting re uh, breast cancer. And having two first degree relatives increases the risk about threefold. And also women with a father or brother with breast cancer have higher risk of breast cancer. A woman with cancer in one breast has a higher risk of developing new cancer in the same or in other breast. Uh, also some uh, ethnicity uh, 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 lowers or uh, can higher the risk because African-American women have higher risk uh, and Asian, Hispanic and Native American women have lower risk of developing and dying from breast cancer. Taller women have higher risk than shorter. The reason for this um, isn't exactly clear, but it has something to do with factors that affect early growth such as nutrition early in life and uh, hormonal and genetic factors. 
women with breast with dense breasts on mammogram have a risk of breast cancer that is about 1.5 to two times uh, uh, that of women with uh, average breast density. And unfortunately also dense breast tissue can um, make it harder to see cancer on mammogram. Uh, women diagnosed with certain benign breast conditions may have a higher risk of breast cancer. Uh, those conditions are uh, atypical hyperplasia, papillomas, fibrocytic exchanges. Menstrual cycles increase the risk due to a longer lifetime exposure uh, to the hormones estrogen and progesterone. It, uh, uh, in women that have early menarche uh, before the age of 12 or late menopause uh, after the age of 55. Also, the risk is higher for women who had a radiation therapy because of another cancer um, when they were young, when breasts uh, are developing. And then another list are modifiable uh, factors. Uh, modifiable factors can be changed or influenced with our behavior. Drinking alcohol is clearly linked to increased risk and the risk increases for 10% for every alcoholic drink per day compared with non-drinkers and women who have, um, for example, two or three drinks a day have about a 20% higher risk than non-drinkers. Being overweight or obese after menopause increases the risk because, uh, because um, after menopause, most of women's estrogens come from fat tissue. Not being physical active increases breast cancer risk. Women who had not had children or who had their first child after age 30 have higher breast cancer risk overall. Not breastfeeding increases breast cancer risk. Um, oral contraceptives for birth control. Most studies have found that women using oral contraceptives have a slightly higher risk of breast cancer that, than women who have never used them. Uh, but once the pills are stopped, uh, the risk goes back to normal, to average risk within uh, about 10 years. It is similar with hormone therapy, uh, replacement therapy after menopause. Um, risk of breast cancer in is, is increased in case of using combined hormone therapy if they are used in the time of menopause onset and if a woman um, uh, has low body mass index. And similarly as uh, birth, birth control pills, a woman's breast cancer risk goes back to average within five years of stopping this hormone replacement therapy. So we have quite a few protective factors. Uh, to list them and again, they are physical activity, breastfeeding, not drinking alcohol, having children before 30 and having normal body weight after menopause. Um, you may also heard something um, on internet rumors that should suggest there are some controversial risk factors, but they are not proven. And based on the available evidence, there is little, if any, reason uh, to believe that antiperspirants increase the risk of breast cancer and that bras cause breast cancer by obstructing lymph, lymph flow. And new studies have provided very strong data that neither induced nor spontaneous abortion have uh, overall effect on the risk of breast cancer. There are some factors under investigations like tobacco smoking, uh, breast implants, some chemicals, tamoxifen, working night shifts, and non steroid drugs. <clears throat> breast cancer prevention recommendation for all women is living a healthy lifestyle, including healthy weight, physical activity, avoiding alcohol, uh, breastfeeding, using as little as possible hormone therapy after menopause and be breast aware. 
for women, for women at average risk, uh, besides that, organized breast cancer screening between 50 and 69 uh, years of age is recommended. For women at increased risk, uh, genetic counseling and testing is recommended and also close observation after 40 and uh, for some also medicines to lower the risk. For women at very high risk, also we have genetic counseling, testing, close observation, which starts uh, already somewhere between 25 and 35, and also preventive surgery like mastectomy or ovariectomy. Um, breast cancer risk can be assessed with risk evaluation tools. Tools estimate the likelihood of a woman uh, developing breast cancer in, for example, 10 years or uh, over her lifetime. Uh, lately, also polygenic risk score has great potential. It is a number that summarizes the estimated effect of many genetic variants uh, on person's risk of disease. And what is breast awareness? There is actually no right or wrong way to check your breast. It's only important to know how your breasts usually look and feel. And in this way, you can spot any changing changes very quickly and report them to your GP. There is a simple checklist how to be breast aware. Uh, you should know what's normal for you. You should look at your breasts and feel them. You should know what changes to look for, report any changes without delay and attend routine screening if you are 50 or over. Uh, breast cancer screening um, is a very important uh, uh, way of secondary prevention. Screening is checking for disease where there are no symptoms or signs of disease using simple, acceptable, unexpensive and non-invasive test or method. Uh, screening finds disease at an early stage when uh, there is a better chance of curing the disease. Uh, in breast cancer screening, mammography is used as a test. Uh, this is breast imaging with an X-rays uh, that can spot cancers when they are too small to see or feel and when they do not cause any signs of symptoms. The long-term objective of breast cancer screening is cancer-specific mortality reduction. Uh, European Commission uh, Initiative on Breast Cancer recommends mammography screening every two years for women between 50 and 69 years who are asymptomatic and uh, have average risk of breast cancer. Uh, screening does not prevent uh, get, uh, of getting breast cancer and it also has its benefits and harms. It's important uh, that screening is comprehensively organized to be effective. It should be population-based. It should be organized. Uh, there should be a great emphasis on quality assurance uh, and with over 70% of participation. And early detection remains the primary way to prevent the development of life-threatening breast cancer. Breast cancers that are detected when they are smaller or non-palpable are more treatable and associated with more favorable prognosis. European Code Against Cancer uh, includes quite a few recommendations uh, for lowering the risk of breast cancer. So if we repeat, uh, having, have healthy body weight, be physical active, have a healthy diet, uh, not drink alcohol, uh, breastfeed and uh, limit the use of hormone replacement therapy, and of course, take part in organized breast cancer screening program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katya. Very great presentation there, taking us right through from uh, 
the basics of the breast cancer as a disease through to the symptoms, risk factors, things that can prevent, things that increase the risk. I think this is really excellent to set the stage for uh, the following presentation, especially. So thank you very much for preparing that. We've had a couple of questions already. The first uh, came as a result of your slide where you showed I think it was the incidence of breast cancer in the EU 27. And you could see clearly mm -hmm. uh, the, the gradient from those countries with the higher incidence here in Belgium and uh, to those with the much lower. And so uh, the rest of your knowledge were the, the reasons for the differences across countries. Um, I, uh, if we look at the risk factors that were listed there for breast cancer, uh, I think there is, um, uh, we can find some reasons in, um, a, a way of living, like uh, we call it a uh, Western way of living. So having children late, having uh, maybe not breastfeed, maybe not have, ch have children. Also this um, uh, anthropometric factor is uh, important. So taller women have uh, more cancer. So I think that if we uh, look at these uh, risk factors and we know how the women live in some countries, we can uh, explain a lot of reasons for such high burden of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We had a question from Madina mm -hmm. and she's asking about, um, maybe you can say this in specifically to your program in Slovenia, perhaps, as well as more generally, but uh, what's the, the sensitivity of the mammography screening? And also what's the age of the, the screening initiation in your program in particular, because there's across Europe different age range. You showed the guidelines and recently updated with some uh, mm -hmm. more additional evidence towards a, a larger age range particularly, but maybe you can talk a bit from your uh, day job as the leader of the door in Slovenia. Yeah, yeah in Slovenia, uh, um, we have breast cancer screening program for women from 50 to 69. So as it's uh, recommended and the um, sensitivity of the mammography uh, in, in Slovenia is around uh, 95%. So uh, I think that this is very similar in other countries that report this uh, performance indicator. Great, thank you, Katia. And a further question came in about the issue of, uh, let's say, chemo prevention. And maybe again, you can talk a little bit from what happens in Slovenia and how, how you address this. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not very specialized in this chemo prevention. So, um, this question, maybe it's not really uh, very, um, uh, I, I cannot answer it right now because I don't, uh, this is not my job. I'm not very, very familiar with uh, some specificist about this chemo prevention. So mm -hmm. maybe this uh, question can be posed to another person or I can maybe uh, find data and answer later. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, we have uh, Suzette here, who can... Okay, can super, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm a medical oncologist, so... Yeah, you know, <laughs> thank you. So there have been uh, uh, around 10 studies of our world that are randomized studies that have tested all of them, uh, either our SARMs, uh, estrogen just receptor modulator, tamoxifen, raloxifen, etc., or aromatase inhibitors, and the latest study was uh, an Italian study um, uh, tested low dose of uh, tamoxifen. All of these studies um, have demonstrated that uh, these treatments can decrease the risk of breast cancer uh, in women who have a slightly increased risk or high, well, more importantly increased. Uh, the decrease of the risk, the relative decrease is between 50 or 45% to 65%, something like that. So it's, it's very good. The, the only problem is that first of all, it does not have any impact, even if you combine all the trials together on the breast cancer mortality, it's just on the incidence. Second point, you need to have around 40 
to 50 women taking that kind of treatment during five years uh, to avoid one cancer and the side effects are important. So in the US, all those compounds are registered for prevention, while uh, in Europe, it's, it's still not used at all. Uh, not reimbursed in most countries for this uh, for this intent because we consider the risk benefit ratio is not good enough. So what we would need is is more personalized and um, prevention probably and with less side effects. It's it's something that is not considered very acceptable. The only thing is that the low dose tamoxifen that has been developed by the uh, uh, Andrea De Chenzi in uh, in uh, Italy could be of interest with, with for women with high risk because it's very well tolerated. It doesn't have the, the problems that a normal dose tamoxifen has. And it's, it's a small study that I have published, but it looks it has almost the same impact uh, as a normal dose tamoxifen. So this is where we, where we stand for uh, drugs uh, to prevent breast cancer. Excellent. Thank you, Suzette. So great teamwork. That I'm a multidisciplinary epidemiologist and medical oncologist, Timo. So I hand back to Gina to introduce uh, Suzette's presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks again to the speakers for taking the questions and again to Dr. Yarm for giving a, a comprehensive, but yet at the same time concise overview of breast cancer, the risk factors, the protective factors, and also for making the link back to the European Code Against Cancer. So whilst uh, Dr. De La Loge uh, shares her screen, uh, allow me to introduce her. Um, Dr. De La Loge is a medical oncologist and she's specialized in breast cancer. Uh, she has been practicing at the Gustave Roussy Institute in Paris uh, since 1999, uh, where she heads the breast pathology department since 2004. Um, Dr. De La Loge currently leads a multidisciplinary team of about 70 physicians, uh, caregivers and researchers, uh, coordinating and managing all the clinical research and care activities uh, in the field of breast cancer. Um, in the specific, uh, her main uh, research area of expertise are cancer prevention based on individual risk factors, uh, therapeutic development guided by prognostics and predictive biology, as well as the organization of care as a whole. Um, and today, as I said, mentioned before, she's her wearing her hat as um, the coordinate, inv coordinator, inv coordinating investigator of uh, my personal, personal breast cancer screening uh, project, which is a youth funded project. Uh, she will tell us more about in a minute. Um, but in addition to that, uh, at the Gustave Roussy Institute, uh, she also uh, leads the in a new interception program, which is especially dedicated to preci uh, precision prevention of cancers. Um, She's also uh, the author of over 260 uh, international peer-reviewed uh, publications and has made uh, countless presentations over 700 uh, in different international and national conferences. Um, amongst other things, uh, she's a member of the International Advisory Board um, of the Lancet Oncology. Uh, she's the co-editor of the Breast Cancer section of the European Journal of Cancer and the editor of the Genetics sections of the journal The Breast. Um, so Dr. De La Loge, uh, the online floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the impressive presentation of myself. So, uh, and thank you for this uh, very interesting invitation. Thank you for I'm sorry about that. I had a, <laughs> I have a registration uh, voice that is uh, running, so I will uh, not use the registration voice and uh, and uh, use my screen like this, if you don't mind. <laughs> Sorry about that, I have forgotten to withdraw it. Uh, is it okay? Can you see my, my slides properly this way? Uh, yeah, sure. You can put in full presentation mode if you wish. Yeah, the only thing is that, um, yeah, would be, well, I think better like this. Uh, so the, the main idea is that uh, this is something that is discussed everywhere. Uh, in the uh, United States and in Europe by many researchers, but not only researchers, people in charge of uh, public health, etc., uh, is that um, it has been very difficult to, to build uh, community and prevention and screening uh, of cancer in general, and especially breast cancer in the past years. And as we just mentioned before, for example, the there have been uh, 10 studies uh, of breast cancer prevention and finally none of the compounds that were used in these studies is, is used in general. So 
um, we, we just think we need to do something. And it's the same thing for uh, screening, because screening is proposed to many women of our Europe, for example. And uh, uh, right now in my country, for instance, in France, less than 50% of the invited women participate to breast cancer screening is decreasing in all the European countries. And uh, because there is this concern, women's concern right now about the risk benefit ratio. So one way to address this uh, is to develop personalized prevention and personalized screening. The main idea is that uh, among a general population, one might be able to identify women who have different risk of cancers. So obviously, only one, well, one woman in 10 will develop a breast cancer in, during her lifetime. So this is a lot, but this also means that nine women will not develop cancer. And uh, there are tools that we can use right now that combine all the factors that have been highlighted by, uh, by uh, Katia and uh, um, that could help to refine risk. It's going to be very difficult to refine risk at age 20 but once you approach 50, uh, at least pay, past uh, uh, age 40, it's a bit easier to, to um, uh, not too badly predict for the breast cancer risk in the next five to 10 years period. And then you can eventually propose a risk adapted screening and prevention. So this is of important but because it means that for women who would be at low risk, and it could not just be a small amount of the population, could be much bigger than, than that. Uh, this, this woman could avoid uh, mammographic screening potentially. And for women at high risk, this also means that we could have some uh, uh, screening that would be better than the just standard every second or third year uh, mammography that is proposed uh, in Europe. Uh, this is a general vision that has been um, published recently in Nature Reviews of uh, Clinical Oncology and uh, in, in which we have uh, uh, largely participated. So the main thing is the risk-benefit ratio. This is uh, what we need to uh, uh, address and what we need to discuss with all women who consider uh, breast screening. So the benefits, as uh, has been discussed before, is spe uh, specific survival, breast cancer survival, lower stage at uh, diagnosis, which also means to avoid chemotherapy, eventually avoid mastectomy, etc. lower treatment, less sequelae, etc. So we all consider this is of great importance. Uh, but there are risks. The risk is the limited sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity of breast cancer screening uh, is is around 85% or 90% at most right now. Uh, the false positive recalls, which could be a bit stressful. This is a uh, woman who have something, but it's finally benign, but they will have a biopsy for it. And what we call overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis has been a major problem for um, prostate cancer screening, for example. And it's also true for breast cancer screening. What we know is that in some instances, we will identify images on the mammogram that are cancers, but if we would not have done the mammogram, this cancer would never have evolved. And uh, the woman who could have lived all her life without this diagnosis, with, without the treatments, the sequelae, etc. And uh, we know that around 10 or at most 15% of all cancers diagnosed or breast cancer diagnosed are probably overdiagnosis. Of course, this risk is increasing in older women. And the last but not least thing is that uh, if you start mammogram early and you do a lot of mammogram, uh, you could uh, increase the risk of radiation induced cancer. So if you have one mammogram per year starting age 40, which is a lot, uh, we know that one in thousand women could have a, a radiation in induced breast cancer at most. But uh, this is the, the exact opposite of what we want indeed. Uh, so based on this, a risk-based stratified and personalized screening is a major path. Uh, we have, and I will not detail this, excellent medical models right now. Um, uh, there are proof of concept made in high-risk patients, uh, women at very high risk of cancer. We know that if we use, for example, MRI screening, we absolutely, we have a, a great impact on the um, uh, breast cancer survival. And there are tools available that can evaluate the risk in the general population right now. 
that are really not too bad. Uh, just to mention that uh, there has been a considerable uh, increase in the knowledge um, of uh, uh, genetic polymorphisms. I'm not speaking of the, the mutations that have been discussed before. Uh, germline mutations is a very rare situation. Uh, for example, a BRCA1 mutation is present in one in 800 women in Europe, and it, it gives the woman a very high risk of breast cancer, around 80% in her lifetime. Uh, beyond that, there are uh, single polymorphisms that are present in many people. Uh, it's more than 1% of the population for each of them. And we can now identify SNP scores, the single polymorphism scores that combine, uh, for example, for this latest one that is broadly used now, 313 polymorphisms. And altogether, they are very valid in terms of predicting the risk of uh, breast cancer. And here, for example, you can predict the risk of ER positive breast cancer. Um, the women with the lowest percentile have a very, very small risk of breast cancer over time, while those we have with the higher percentile uh, have more than 30% uh, risk of breast cancer over time. And this is also true, uh, but uh, with a lesser risk for ER negative breast cancer, which is uh, rarer. So right now, this has been developed, especially by the teams of Cambridge, and many, it's, it's a huge worldwide effort. And these are ready for prime time and for the potential implementation in the general population, uh, but the need prospective validation. Uh, so towards personalized prevention, what do we need? Uh, so there are strong scientific bases nowadays, but what we need uh, is a formal prospective clinical proof of concept that risk-based screening is better or at least equal, uh, and it would be much better if it's better than the standard screening that we propose today. So we need that prospective uh, evidence uh, in terms of efficiency, but also cost efficiency, feasibility, acceptability, and equitability, which is of uh, utmost importance. But beyond that, we also need to demonstrate that it's feasible in terms of healthcare organization because it requires some very complicated pathways. And uh, to enable it, we also need to construct all the tools, policies, et cetera, um, that, that will um, uh, be required. So this is where MyPEP stands. MyPEP is a, a large European consortium dedicated to developing this in the breast cancer personal uh, screening uh, area. <coughs> Sorry about that. So there are two big uh, randomized uh, breast cancer uh, personalized screening uh, trials in the world. The one in the US is Wisdom and the one in Europe is MyPEPS. Beyond that, there are two cohorts, one in Canada and one in UK. And uh, in Sweden, there probably will be another trial, but uh, it has not started yet. So uh, what is MyPEPS project? MyPEPS is, uh, is funded by the European Commission and it's a huge project with this clinical trial that I will describe you uh, and a lot of work packages like it's usual in the European projects. Uh, and, but very importantly, they, they aim at the economical evaluation of this uh, strategy, the sociological, ethical, psychological assessments that are absolutely necessary because well, we don't know whether uh, assessing risk of a person could not be more deleterious than beneficial. We need to make sure that we do it properly and that uh, it's uh, well taken and it has an impact. And um, there is a lot about communication and dissemination. And at the end, the European Commission asks us to provide the, them with the recommendations on whether, how, for whom, etc. this kind of approach uh, would be uh, a standard in the potential future. So this is our trial. So the, the consortium is very large. And uh, as you may see, the European Cancer League is a part of this uh, very large European consortium. We have been working together for years. So it has been uh, funded by, uh, by uh, the European uh, Commission, as I mentioned. So briefly, what we aim in this study is to uh, propose the study and include 85,000 women over 2.5 years, and then they will be followed for four years. 
These women are general population women of six countries. Uh, they have 42, they are 40 to 70 years old and are invited for, uh, uh, for screening. So they have a dedicated visit with a clinician. We exclude uh, women at high risk, uh, already identified like prior breast cancer or BRCA mutation, etc. And for those who accept, we randomize them uh, between two strategies. The first one is the standard screening according to the ongoing recommendation of each country. So business as usual. And the second one is a risk stratified uh, a strategy. This means that we do a risk evaluation. So the risk evaluation uses um, a classical clinical factors, family history, breast density, age, etc., as mentioned by my colleague, and also a salivary test, uh, which is a um, uh, uh, DNA extraction and uh, the identification of the polymorphism, uh, 313 polymorphism uh, score that we have seen before. And we provide these women with their own risk estimation and we propose them a risk-based screening according to their five-year risk of developing a, an invasive breast cancer. So we do compare these two strategies uh, on the primary objective on endpoint, that is the incidence of stage two or higher breast cancer in each group. So what we want is to decrease this incidence clearly. Uh, so we want this, this, to, this uh, strategy to be at least equal and eventually and hopefully better than the standard uh, screening strategy. Uh, so primary objective is non-inferiority, but the key secondary is superiority, and we hope so in terms of incidence of advanced uh, breast cancer. So there are a lot of other objectives. We will not go through all these, but uh, we, we need to see what is the impact on the false positive findings, the psychosocial impacts, the cost effectiveness, the risk of overdiagnosis, etc., because this is the risk benefit uh, balance that, that we need to, uh, to address. And there is a lot of uh, additional research, uh, of course. So inclusion is women aged 40 to 70 who never had cancer, uh, do not have an already identified predisposition, uh, do, did not get undergo a, a bilateral mastectomy, uh, of course. And of course, they do need to provide an informed consent for this uh, study. Um, it's, it's quite light in terms of uh, of uh, organization because they see a physician once and then uh, most of the, um, the things during four years and the follow-up can, do, can be done remotely. They are asked for the news once a year. It's not very complicated. So for the risk estimation, we use uh, um, uh, scores, the breast cancer screening consortium score or the thyroid score according to the presence or not of a family history plus the polymorphism score, as we have uh, mentioned before. So what is our proposed screening strategy in uh, those women who are randomized in the risk stratified arm? If they are considered at low risk, this means that they have less than 1% risk of invasive breast cancer at, four year, at five years, so it's very low. Uh, the next mammogram will be at the end of study, after four years. No mammogram before that. So we, we kind of increase the, the interval between two mammograms. For the average risk, we propose the standard uh, procedure, which is every second year. Uh, if they have high density, then we use ultrasound, of course. For the high-risk women, they have a yearly mammogram. And for the very rare, very rare uh, women with very high risk, uh, like equivalent to a BRCA mutation, for example, they have an additional yearly uh, mammogram. And uh, so this is ongoing, of course, the inclusion are ongoing. It has stopped for the COVID. So uh, we started not so long ago. We have uh, around 4,500 4, women who have already entered the study and it's increasing uh, rapidly. Um, we have so a, a web platform that is um, uh, held by a, a Belgian company called uh, Aonix that sustains all the activities. And this is very important, not only to the success of the trial, but also to uh, the success of the implementation if, if this strategy were uh, to be adopted in the, in the future. It would be very important that we have described how it can be done, how can uh, the circulation of the information 
uh, in a, a very, very um, uh, strict way be done between six different countries, uh, adapted to the different uh, screening uh, uh, organization in each country, because this is the key issue. We have embedded this trial into the screening organization of the six countries. Uh, so what are the countries? UK, uh, Belgium, Spain, uh, Spain is joining uh, uh, soon. They have uh, joined us uh, lately. Uh, Italy is a big contributor to the study. Israel and uh, France. These are the six countries with, uh, you can believe me, six absolutely different organizations of the screening program. Uh, so it's, it, it has been kind of a small nightmare to try and have this trial work in each, uh, in each country, but it, it does indeed. Uh, and uh, I think that that has been a, a huge and incredible effort. So what are the expected outcomes? First of all, the strong evidence to sustain, hopefully or not, if we fail, the implementation of risk-based screening in the general population with future uh, EU recommendation, efficacy, risk benefit, target population, cost, psychosocial impact. We should know everything about it. And we should prepare stakeholders, and ECL is very involved in this uh, in this part. Uh, but of course, this huge court will also generate a lot of information uh, that could be very useful for the future uh, to identify new risk models, to refine our ability to identify uh, uh, an individual's risk, new software, new cancer risk genes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we will work, and we are working on the images as well and eventually new economical models uh, as well. So thank you very much uh, for listening to this presentation and I'm hopefully uh, open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzette. That's a great overview of the, the trial and the evidence behind it. It's really fantastic. So thank you for preparing that for us and delivering it. It's really great. Uh, we have several questions, as you'd expect, because this is really a uh, interesting and thought-provoking topic and, and the project itself. So the first question was about, you showed some examples of ongoing uh, studies and cohorts, studies with PROCAST in the UK, the WISDOM trial over in the States. Uh, one participant asked about the tailored breast screening study, uh, which is in uh, Northern Italy, and looking at um, pre-menopausal women and a different screening regime for them. So were these factors taken into account because there are several countries involved in the studies that they bring into the, the protocol development, the ongoing trials or evidence or recent evidence generation at a national or regional level in those uh, countries uh, to inform the, the protocol itself? Um, so the, the, the TBST study is not uh, design as is uh, uh, my peps or uh, wisdom. It doesn't uh, aim at um, assessing whether a risk-based screening uh, is relevant. There are other studies that consider that uh, uh, it's like a cohort study because they already assess the risk and then propose a, a, a risk-based assessment. This is uh, a different approach. And uh, there is also um, a, a trial uh, ongoing in the UK in a very specific population. So in these trials, people uh, already determine what is the specific population they want to target. So the aim of my peps is really to make the proof of principle regarding the, the overall approach in the general population, not only in a very specific subpopulation indeed. Great, that's very clear, thank you. And then we have a further question. Why was the four year period chosen as follow up? <laughs> That's a very good question. This is absolutely empirical. So you, you know why? Because um, uh, European projects are limited to eight years. So we had to have a 2.5 years accrual period and four years follow up. So we designed the study so that we would have enough power. Uh, uh, of course, it would have been much better to have an endpoint at six years, but the, the main, the first main problem would be that once we come with the results, they will be totally outdated because this field is moving very rapidly, and and uh, well, many countries are thinking about uh, risk-based screening. And the second problem is that 
Um, well, it would have been too long for the European Commission anyway. Nobody wants to fund trials that last long. This doesn't mean that we will not have this full of data. We will, but the major or the primary endpoint is indeed that four years. That's a good question, of course. <laughs> and another question about the endpoints. Um, why not address, uh, it's linked to that, I, I suppose, why not address uh, mortality as outcome? Uh, that's an excellent question as well. And um, because all the, the trials in uh, breast cancer screening, all of them have, uh, uh, no, most of them have used uh, breast cancer specific mortality. And um, so right now we are in a situation where everybody uh, gets screening. So what we want is to improve screening, do it better, etc. But with just a risk-based strategy, our ability to um, improve this screening is uh, uh, not a major one. We, what we think is that we should be able to avoid uh, between uh, 25 to 30 percent of the stage two and higher breast cancers, which is already a lot. But to turn this into um, a specific mortality impacts. Uh, we would need a, a, a much bigger population. That's the main. That's the main issue. Uh, we would have needed around uh, two hundred thousand. So what we have planned. Uh, so second point is that um, it has been published and recognized that uh, stage two and higher disease uh, can be a good surrogate of uh, specific survival. This has been published years ago by our, our colleagues uh, from UK, um, uh, Duffy. And, uh, and the last point is that we, we work with the wisdom trial so that at the end we can merge the data and uh, see what is the impact on the specific mortality. This has been planned uh, together from the, from the beginning. But of course, this is an important question. And the uh, last question was about the, the role of the use of the mammal, mammal risk uh, to within the project. Okay, so there are di different companies um, uh, uh, currently that develop tools uh, that are able to assess uh, for the risk. So MammoRisk is a tool that has been developed by a, a French company. And indeed, this, this French company is Predilife. Predilife is in charge of the risk assessment within uh, MyPeps. But MammoRisk is, is the uh, is the, is the tool they have developed that they say, uh, and indeed they, have, uh, they also have uh, assessments of the inclusion of, uh, of SNPs with mammal risk. Uh, so indeed, Pretty Life is the, the, the company, because it's a private company, in charge of risk assessment within that project, but this is an academic project and what they do for us is academic. And mammal risk is the, uh, 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 private um, test that they say. Mm -hmm. That's great. So the last thing to say is to remind people that the recruitment is now uh, open again following the, the pause during the yeah. period. In this is six countries, not everywhere, depending on the countries. So for Italy, it's most, uh, most regions of the north part of Italy. For Belgium, it's, uh, it's the French Belgium and Leuven as well. Uh, for UK, it's uh, Cambridge, Manchester, and Leeds. Uh, for Spain, it's in Barcelona. For Israel, it's all over the country. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge representation of the countries. It's not absolutely everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, well, we, we do hope that we will be able to, um, to accrue a lot so that we can answer this, uh, this question. Indeed, there is... Um, uh, great interest uh, uh, from women uh, to whom we proposed this study. Uh, it's something that seems to be uh, well received, but uh, it, it requires explanations. But I think even uh, going for a standard screening nowadays absolutely requires explanation on the risk and benefits, etc. So my pet is also the occasion to, to refine the discussion with the woman, etc. Why are we trying to improve breast screening, etc.? And uh, I have to mention that there have been fears uh, about the thing that we will decrease the screening in some populations. Uh, on the physician's side, these are the, the most important fears, decreasing screenings. <laughs> so there are fears about increasing, fears about decreasing. 
and uh, it's always very difficult to decrease. It's much easier to increase in medicine than to decrease. So I think we absolutely need uh, proof that we can decrease and uh, no other trials uh, nowadays uh, will, will demonstrate this. We can decrease in some populations. Fantastic, thanks. We're just running out of time now, so any questions can be uh, fielded by email afterwards, and also please uh, do visit the, the MyPEPS uh, website too, and uh, be in touch with us. As, uh, as you've seen, this is a really excellent um, project, and uh, we fully support it. So now I hand over to Gina and Medina for the short poll, just to, to wrap things up. Sure. Uh, thanks, David, and thank you, uh, Dr. De La Lodge, for again for your presentation about this pioneer project because it really is. And of course, we have the, my, the wisdom one in the US, but in Europe, it's a kind of a pioneer project. And uh, as you mentioned, the ECL is involved in the work package about communication, so uh, we're really looking forward to see how we can kind of help uh, the restarting the trials uh, during these challenging times. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm just going to launch a poll. So you it should appear on your screen in just a second. Um, Last times it didn't work for those of you who are minimizing your screen. So if you want to take part, please just uh, maximize your screens. And Madina will quickly run, uh, read the questions out loud and you have about 10 seconds to reply um, just to make it a bit more participatory. So you should see it on your screen. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Which of the following statements is true? Which message of European Code Against Cancer is linked to breast cancer risk reduction? Men cannot get cannot diagnosed uh, with breast cancer. True or false? Those using hormone replacement therapy are at increased risk of developing which of the following Answers. Which of the following is the most aggressive forms of breast cancer? Which of the following molecular subtypes of breast cancer has the best prognosis? Good. Keep your question, uh, your answers coming. I think about 10 of you have already answered. And it looks like most of you picked the right answers, so which is great. So it means that you are following the webinar or you're just very knowledgeable about it. So I'll just give you a bit more time uh, to answer and we will share the correct answers after the webinar as well, alongside with the recording and the slides. Okay, I think we're, we're done with the poll. So thanks everyone for taking part in that, just to see if you're listening, paying attention there. And as Gina says, we'll share you the results and the correct answers afterwards, so you can self-assess at that point. So we're out of time. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks especially to the speakers, to Suzette, to Katya, and to uh, Dia Medina, and of course to, to Gina for the moderation. Uh, I think it was, of course, we have, we have to put this in context that this month is uh, Pink October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and it was very important for us to highlight these issues during this special uh, commemoration month and really to underscore the importance and our support behind the, the MyPEPS trial. So please, if you have any questions uh, regarding the trial, we're here to, to field you towards the experts to help promote and raise awareness of this, its missions and goals overall. I think we've had really a good uh, introduction into the topic from Katya. Katya is also uh, the expert for the leader of the breast screening program in Slovenia, which is really an exemplary country there. Not a country that's in the, the MyPEPS trial, but she's doing her research also on this topic on uh, risk stratification for screening. So we hope that the outcomes and uh, results we expect to see from the MyPEPS trial will be eventually taken to scale and transferred to improve uh, breast screening for women across Europe and to help us uh, really contain this, uh, this disease. So thanks everyone. We will share the slides, the presentation recording, 
and the, the outcome from the poll after the, the meeting. And uh, we wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you.